Hi, Mike Stish for Hackaday.com. In this installment of Scope Noob, I'm working on direct digital synthesis. This is a method of generating an analog signal using digital output pins. I was inspired to do this by an installment of uh, Bill Hurd's video series a few weeks ago on the topic. He was using programmable logic, but as you can see here, I'm using a microcontroller. In this case, I'm using the Hackaday 10th Anniversary Trinket Pro, which is just something that was sitting on my desk and it was pretty easy for me to set up. And in order to make this work, we're using what's called an R2R ladder. It's a, kind of a series of resist, uh, resistor dividers. And these resistors are just in a ratio of one to two. So here I'm using 1K and 500 ohm resistors. That might be a little bit low. You can, I've seen it used a lot higher, maybe like uh, 10K and 20K. Uh, your results may vary, but for this experiment, it uh, worked just fine. So the first thing that I wanted to do is just put a loop that counts through a 256-bit value and writes that out to the R2R ladder. And we see a ramp signal right here. I also have a pin uh, this is the sixth of eight bits that I'm probing on the pin, and you can see that on channel two. But you can't do anything else with the microcontroller while this is happening. So the next thing that I wanted to do was go ahead and switch over to using interrupts. All right. Now it looks very similar to the way that it did before, but check this out. The frequency here, it's oscillating a little bit, but I've set it up with the timer to trip, I think at 142 cycles, the timer is running right with the system clock, which is 16 megahertz. And uh, with 256 bits of resolution, I'm actually getting 440 hertz. That's a magic number for an A, it's the tuning A for orchestra. And if you're going to generate sound, I figure that's a, a good starting place. So I went for that here. For me, I'm interested in generating a sine wave, a nice smooth sine wave, and so I actually found a website that will take parameters and generate a table of values that you can feed in. And the first thing that I did was just implement that with some nice clean C code. Look at how nice and clean this C code is. It kind of makes you happy. Uh, I found that there were some problems with that. The first is, look at when I scroll in and out, I can get a double waveform here. Let's see if I can do it even better. If I mess with the trigger a little bit. Yeah, check that out. So I get two waveforms there. So how is that even possible? That's that's super interesting to me. All right, so I actually talked to Adam Fabio about this, and he mentioned that I'm probably triggering when I shouldn't be. And there's a couple of things that I can do to stave that off. So one of them is there's this noise reject option and sometimes that works I found. I probably should look that up and see what it's actually meant for. Uh, it doesn't always work. So in this case I'm not getting it to work. The other one, and I watched a video, EEV blog video by Dave Jones where he explains hold off. This hold off is an interesting feature. What it does is it tells the scope don't trigger for this amount of time. Right now it's set to the lowest for this scope, which is 16 nanoseconds. I've found that a setting of about 2.1 milliseconds is what I need for this particular waveform. Let's see if that takes care of it for me. Boom, there we go. So now we get a nice steady waveform. So once I figured that out, I started looking, if you can see closely here, there are some display artifacts. Well, they're not actually display artifacts. They're artifacts of the signal itself. And that was interesting to me. So I tried to scroll in on those. And what you can do is use your trigger to kind of change the display because you'll only be able to shift so much. And let's use that shift now. So the shift is like the fine adjustment here and we do we're getting some inversion when we do that but I think that's I'll find a way to get what we're looking for hmm all right I'd like to scroll in on that let's see what we can do here 
All right, so, and I'm just gonna go ahead and stop that so that we can use our cursor right here in manual mode. And put that at the beginning and at the end, and we can look and see that we're at about 1.024 microseconds. So that's actually kind of a lot if you're looking for a nice smooth signal. One of the things that I find quite interesting is that I went to probe the pins. That's how I ended up uh, probing pin six of eight. So that would be, I guess, the fifth bit. Uh, and you can see that the artifacts that I'm talking about actually match up with these pin changes. So every time there's an artifact, it's that pin changing. This is something that's interesting about the microcontroller. So this particular board that I'm using doesn't have a full 8-bit port broken out. The biggest that it has is 6 bits. That's because port C has the reset line and an unconnected pin. or an un, there, There's a pin on port C that's not available on this microcontroller. So there's only 6 pins on port C. I'm using all 6 of those. There are also only 6 pins on port B because 2 of them are used for the bootloader of the Trinket Pro. The pin that I'm probing is the last pin on port C. So where we're getting this artifact is when I'm switching over between port C to port B. And that's kind of a long time considering how quickly I'm running my microcontroller. So I actually went to look at the source code. Uh, sorry, I went to look at the assembly code that was generated from my you know, concise and beautiful C. And I found the problem. There's all of these calls that are happening in between writing to port C and writing to port B. So I went in and I used what I would call a, a pre-wind. So the thing is, when you get into the service routine, the first thing that you want to do is load your, your port data because the ISR, the interrupt service routine, is hardware driven. So it's going to be the best timing if you can perform your write at exactly that point. And so I altered my code in order to use uh, what I call a prewind. It's a variable that I store the value to for the next service routine. And in this case, I still have these artifacts. Let me see if I can find one. So there's one of the artifacts right there, but if I go into my cursor and measure them again, now I'm only getting 216 nanoseconds, which is much better. And if you look at the assembly this time, there is one instruction in between writing to the two ports, and that instruction is loading the variable value into a register in order to write that register to the port. I'm not really up on my assembly right now. I'm pretty sure that you could write it to, so that you loaded the port C and the port B value into two temporary registers and then uh, wrote port C and port B one right after the other, and what you'd end up with is uh, this should be about half the time, I would think. Uh, but I could be wrong on that. Correct me in the comments, uh, depending on what you think. So uh, I found this really interesting way to look at what's actually happening with your microcontroller to use it to go back and, and troubleshoot the code that you're using. And this is one of the main reasons why I wanted to scope is for this ability. So, hey, a really great find this week on Scope Noob. We'll see you in the next installment.